The MLB draft started in 1965 and was an instant success, allowing every team to have an opportunity to bring elite talent into their organization. The Kansas City Athletics took Rick Monday with the first overall pick, and he became an all-star player. However, one of the most intriguing aspects of the draft is that even if a team is picking beyond the first round, you never know when you'll find a diamond in a rough. The Reds, for example, took a catcher in the second round named Johnny Bench. Sometimes these amazing finds occur even deeper, much deeper in the draft. And today we will begin our exploration into the top 20 biggest draft steals of all time. The only criteria is that the pick had to occur outside of the top five rounds. And this list only contains retired players. Also, of course, the player had to have signed with the team that drafted him. Later, I'll also make a video on MLB draft steals for active players. Even if the player in question today found success with a different team than the one he was drafted by, he will still be considered for the list even though the team that quote unquote stole him never benefited from the steal. This list will rank these players based on how late they were taken compared to how good they actually became. Today we'll list numbers 20 through 11, and tomorrow's follow-up video will rank the top 10. I want to give a big shout out to John Smith for suggesting this topic. So let's get started. And I'm going to start with an honorable mention. He was one of my favorite players and a former giant. Honorable mention, Rob Nin. Round 32, overall 831st. My honorable mention is going to be a former giant closer, Rob Nin, who was a third baseman and pitcher at Los Alamitos High School. He wasn't valued too highly, but did have some MLB blood as the son of former big leaguer Dick Nin. And the Rangers took a chance on him in the 32nd round of the 1987 draft. He was the 831st overall selection, and of the 25 players picked in the 32nd round that year, only two made the big leagues, Rob Nin and Jim Campbell, who appeared in exactly two MLB games. Nin worked his way through the minors as a starter and made his MLB debut with the Rangers in 1993. He was injury prone and ineffective with Texas, but after he was traded to the Marlins, he was moved to the bullpen and found his calling. He racked up over 100 saves for the Marlins and became an elite MLB closer. His dominance helped them win a World Series in 1997, and for the next five years, he averaged 41 saves per season for the San Francisco Giants. He continued to dominate in the postseason, helping the Giants become NL champs in 2002. But unfortunately, injuries and surgeries brought his career to an early end. He still managed over 300 saves as a round 32 pick. So let's get in to the top 20. At number 20, Mark Burley. Round 38, overall 1,139th. Next up, we have Mark Burley, a pitcher who didn't even make the team during his sophomore year of high school. He worked hard and became good enough to attend Jefferson College, a community college in Missouri. The White Sox took him in the 38th round with a 1,139th pick. And at this point in the draft, teams are just filling rosters for their minor league affiliates. No one else in that round ever made any kind of impact in the major leagues. Burley pitched extremely well in the minors and quickly made the big league club in 2001, where he went 16-8 in his first full season with a 3.29 ERA. In 2002, he made the all-star team and won 19 games. The White Sox had struck gold in the 38th round. He went on to make five all-star teams in addition to 214 big league wins with the White Sox, Marlins, and Blue Jays. In 2021, he received 11% of the vote for the Hall of Fame, allowing him to stay on the ballot. Burley went from getting cut from his high school team to getting picked very late in the MLB draft to winning over 200 major league games. Number 19, Jeff Conine. Round 58 overall, 1,226th. If getting picked as the 1,139th overall pick sounds bad, how about the 1,226th? That's how low Jeff Conine was picked by the Kansas City Royals in the 1987 draft, a draft that broke a record for the number of draft picks. Most years, Conine would have never even been picked. No one else in the 58th round made it above low A ball. The most shocking thing about Conine is that at UCLA, 
He was a pitcher, and just an average pitcher at that. And he only had one plate appearance as a hitter in which he was hit by a pitch. It was a Royals scout named Guy Hansen who convinced the Royals to draft him. At this point in the draft, the Royals figured, why not? No one was expected to pan out anyway. Conine had no issues at all with minor league pitching and hit 320 in double A with 15 bombs. In triple A, he hit 302 with 20 homers. The Royals knew they hit the jackpot and promoted Conine to the majors. Unfortunately for them, the Florida Marlins were an expansion team and snagged up Conine in their inaugural draft, moved him to left field, and found their franchise player. He is the only player who was with the Marlins for both their 1997 and 2003 World Championships, although he did play for the Orioles in between. He also won an All-Star Game MVP award and retired with over 200 home runs and 1,000 RBIs. Not bad for a 1,226th overall pick. Number 18, Jim Edmonds. Round seven overall, 169th. Jim Edmonds is a player who was recently highlighted in one of my top Hall of Fame snubs rankings. Although he should be in the Hall of Fame, in my opinion, he is ranked number 17 since he wasn't drafted ridiculously low, but still low. He was taken by the California Angels in the seventh round as the 169th overall pick in between Bernie Jenkins and Bill St. Peter, neither of whom made it above double A. Edmonds was considered damaged goods. He had a shoulder injury in high school, but he showed serious promise in the minors by hitting over 290 in high A and then over 300 in double and triple A. His defense was also top notch and the Angels promoted him in 1993. They still weren't convinced he was the answer and signed free agents Bo Jackson and Dwight Smith for the 94 season. Nevertheless, Edmonds forced his way into the lineup and was in rookie of the year talks when the season was abruptly ended by a strike. The next year, his bat exploded Edmonds crushed 33 home runs and drove in 107 runs while making ridiculous plays in the outfield. He went on to be an absolute machine for the St. Louis Cardinals, averaging 35 home runs a year for six years. He finished his career with a 284 average, 393 bombs, eight gold gloves, a silver slugger, and four all-star selections, all representing the seventh round. Number 17, Fred McGriff. Round 9, overall, 233rd. Another huge Hall of Fame snub who was taken even later than Edmonds is Fred McGriff. He loved the game of baseball as a kid and always hung out around the Red Spring Training Camp in Tampa, Florida. Unfortunately, even in his high school days, Fred McGriff was getting snubbed as he was cut from his sophomore team. He made the team the next year, though, but no scouts paid much attention to him. That is, until a few scouts were checking out Doc Gooden pitch, and they saw this Fred McGriff kid hit a towering home run off Doc. The New York Yankees, with the last pick of the ninth round, decided to go ahead and take a shot at him as the 233rd overall pick. He showed some promise in Rookie League by hitting 272 with nine home runs. Then, figuring they were already good at first base with Don Mattingly, the Yankees let their draft steal go by trading McGriff along with Dave Collins and Mike Morgan the Blue Jays for Dale Murray and Tom Dodd. They should have asked for much more. McGriff ended up smashing 20 bombs for the Jays in 1987, then 34, beginning a streak of seven straight 30-plus home run seasons. In 1990, the Jays also traded McGriff, although they got much better value in return by getting Joe Carter and Roberto Alomar from San Diego. Nevertheless, McGriff still put up big numbers with the Padres. And then the Braves, who picked him up at the trade deadline in 1993 to help them try to catch the red-hot Giants. He was the spark they needed, literally as the Braves stadium caught on fire right after the trade, and figuratively as the Braves won the division that year. In 1995, he helped them win the World Series. McGriff retired with 493 home runs and a 284 batting average and had an absolute no doubt Hall of Fame career despite the fact that he inexplicably was never elected. He did all that and more as a ninth round selection. Number 16, Kenny Lofton. Round 17 overall, 428. Next up, it was the 1988 MLB Draft and the Houston Astros with the 428th overall pick took Kenny Lofton. Only two other players in the seventh round made it to the big leagues, and their combined war is negative two. Lofton was a basketball player for the Arizona Wildcats, 
and played in the Final Four in 1988. It wasn't until his junior year that he decided to go try out for the baseball team. Although he made the team for his speed and athleticism, he played in just five games, and he got just one at bat. An Astros scout, however, noticed his speed and thought it was worth a shot in the later rounds, even though he wasn't really a baseball player yet. He wasn't great in his first minor league year with a 214 average, but it was a lot better than anyone expected, and he did steal 26 bases. So they let him play in a second minor league season. Everything clicked. Lofton hit 292 and stole 40 bases. The next year in Double A, he hit 331 with 62 steals. He was not only showing the incredible speed that he was drafted for, he was also a natural with the bat, rarely striking out, putting the ball in play, getting on base, and wreaking havoc for the opponent. The Astros decided that since they needed a catcher and already had Steve Finley in center field, that they would trade Lofton. He was sent to Cleveland for catcher Eddie Tobinsey and pitcher Willie Blair. In 1992, Tobinsey hit 222 for the Astros, and Kenny Lofton became a superstar for the Indians. He made six straight All-Star teams, led the league in steals for five straight years, and went on to help the San Francisco Giants win the NL pennant in 2002. He also won four gold gloves and even hit 130 career home runs. As a non-baseball player who had one college at bat, he is perhaps the most unlikely draft pick to go on to have what can be considered by many to be a Hall of Fame-worthy career, although to this day, he still has not been elected. Number 15, Mark Grace. Round 24 overall, 620 seconds. Coming in at number 15 is first baseman Mark Grace, who was originally drafted in the 15th round by the Twins, but did not sign. He played at San Diego State University in 1985, hitting 395 with a couple home runs, not showing much power, but an incredibly smooth swing and a solid, reliable glove. Apparently, this wasn't impressive enough for most teams as Grace was passed on round after round after round in the 1985 MLB draft. Finally, in the 24th round, after the Red Sox took Eric Lasky, it was the Chicago Cubs who selected Mark Grace. He instantly tore up the minor leagues with a 342 average in A-ball and an impressive 15 round trippers. The next year in Double A, he hit 333 with 17 bombs. The Cubs made him a regular in 1988, and he impressed, hitting 296 and finishing second in the Rookie of the Year voting to Chris Sabo. Grace went on to be a constant producer for the Cubs, consistently hitting well above 300 with moderate power and elite defense. He made three All-Star teams and won four Gold Gloves. In 2001, he signed with the Diamondbacks and helped them win their first World Series. Grace hit 329 in his postseason career and retired with a 303 average and 2,445 hits. He led an entire decade in hits and in fact is the only player to do so other than Pete Rose, who is not now in the Hall of Fame. Not too shabby for a guy picked in the 15th and then 24th round. Number 14, Oral Hershiser. Round 17 overall, 440th. The original scouting report for Oral Hershiser, a relief pitcher for Bowling Green, said that he was rattled easily, had questionable makeup, a weak fastball, and a curveball that he didn't even know how to properly throw. So it's no surprise that it took a team until the 14th round to take him, and that team was the Los Angeles Dodgers. He was taken in between Raymond Alonzo and Rob Teagarden, who both made it to double A and no higher. The only other notable pick in Hershiser's round was a decent steal himself, current Rockies manager Bud Black. Hershiser worked his way through the minors and looked halfway decent, but nothing extraordinary. He struggled in the big leagues, and after one particular rough outing, manager Tommy Lasorda gave him a scolding he would never forget, telling him he was being too nice on the mound. He needed to toughen up. He needed to be a bulldog. The nickname stuck. And the Bulldog went on to go 19-3 in 1985, finishing third for the Cy Young. In 1988, he was even better, winning the Cy Young and going 23-8 while leading the Dodgers to a World Series title. He threw a mind-blowing 59 consecutive scoreless innings, an MLB record. Later with the Indians, he went 16-6 and led the team to their first postseason appearance in 41 years. He also pitched for the Giants and Mets, before returning to the Dodgers for one last season. Hershiser won 204 games, a Cy Young, a Gold Glove, an ALCS MVP, an NLCS MVP, a World Series MVP, 
and a silver slugger. So much for a 17th round pick with questionable makeup. Unfortunately, Oral Hershiser has yet to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Number 13, Ozzie Smith. Round seven, overall, 146th. Next up, we have a seventh round pick who has made it into Cooperstown, and it is the wizard, Ozzie Smith, the 146th overall pick in the 1976 draft. Smith was a big baseball fan as a kid and played both basketball and baseball in high school. He attended Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo and walked on to their baseball team as a backup infielder. When the regular shortstop broke his leg, Smith took over and impressed with amazing defense, blazing speed, and a solid bat. After his junior year, the Tigers took him in the seventh round, but they couldn't agree on a bonus. The Tigers missed out on Ozzie over $1,500, and the next year, the Padres drafted him again in the seventh, and this time he signed. He dazzled in the minors with the glove and the bat and was quickly promoted, where he established himself as one of the best defenders in the game. Just 10 games into his career, he made one of the most spectacular plays ever caught on video, with a dive on a ball going up the middle that took a bad hop. Smith somehow reached back and snagged it with his bare hand and threw the runner out. Later, because of some animosity between the Padres and Smith's agent, San Diego dealt him to the Cardinals for Gary Templeton, who the Cardinals were all too ready to get rid of due to fans booing him for his lackadaisical style of play and body language. The rest is history, of course, as Ozzie Smith became a Cardinals legend, winning 13 gold gloves and making 15 total All-Star games, including one with the Padres back in 1981. He was elected to the Hall of Fame on his first ballot. Number 12, Wade Boggs. Round seven overall, 166th. Amazingly, that 1976 seventh round also produced another Hall of Famer, and his name is Wade Boggs. Boggs was an all-state football player in high school and earned a scholarship to the University of South Carolina. He also played baseball, but was not exactly a hot name in the draft. It was likely no MLB team would take him if not for a scout named George Digby, who fought hard for the Red Sox to draft this kid. He told them that he had an incredibly smooth swing. The Red Sox front office didn't think he had MLB talent, but what the heck, it was the seventh round, so they took Digby's advice. As a prospect that the Red Sox did not consider a future big leaguer, they were very slow to move him up the minor league ladder. However, they could not ignore his stats. A 332 average in A-ball, 325 in AA, 335 in AAA, this guy was a hitting machine, but could he do it at the big league level? We all know the answer. Boggs hit 349 in his rookie year and followed it up by leading the league with a 361 batting average and 444 on base percentage. He never stopped hitting. Boggs led the league in batting average five out of six seasons at one point and made 12 all-star teams. He also played solid defense, taking home two gold gloves. He finished his career with over 3,000 hits, a 328 average, and even smashed 24 home runs in 1987. He was a first ballot shoe-in Hall of Famer and is one of the best pure hitters to ever play the game. He did it all as a seventh round pick. Number 11, Jim Tomey. Round 13 overall, 333rd. Next up, the biggest steal in part one of this list, Jim Tomey, a Hall of Famer who was taken in the 13th round and 333rd overall. Only one other player, Mike Oquist, made the big leagues from this round. In high school, Tomey was considered underweight and lacking in potential. No team drafted him. Then, at a community college, he showed a bit more promise and, as basically an afterthought, the Indians drafted him in the 13th round. No one would have batted an eye if he washed out of the minor leagues after one or two seasons. Instead, he hit 340 in A ball with 16 home runs. Then, the next season, between AA and AAA, he hit 319 and drove in 73 runs. The Indians took serious notice at this point and brought him up to the big leagues, where he hit 255 in his first 27 games. He still wasn't considered a massive prospect and bounced back and forth from AAA to MLB for a few years until he smashed 20 home runs in 1994 and earned a permanent spot in the lineup. By 97, he was a superstar with 40 bombs that year and an OPS over 1,000. He led the league with 120 RBIs and didn't slow down from there, driving in over 100 runs for seven of the next nine years. In 2003, with Philadelphia, 
He hit a career-high 47 home runs and retired with an astonishing 612, becoming the eighth player of the 600 home run club. He received 89.8% of the vote in his first year on the ballot. Jim Tomey went from a skinny, undrafted high school kid to a 13th round minor league roster filler to a no doubt first ballot Hall of Famer. And that does it for part one of the top 20 MLB draft steals of all time. This list was absolutely incredible and the top 10 list is even crazier. So don't miss part two of the video, which will premiere tomorrow if you're watching this on day one. If you're watching this video after day one, part two is already live and you should see a link of it above. So feel free to click on that and check out the top 10 draft steals of all time. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for checking out this video and we will talk to you next time.